So very recently, Sherry and I had a chance to, uh, we were in Manhattan, Kansas at Manhattan Christian College, where I graduated from many, many years ago for this annual meeting they have. And I hadn't been in a very long time, and, and uh, I was feeling guilty about that. And then my daughter Zoe goes to Manhattan Christian College, and we're all the time at uh, our daughter Lacey's softball games or my son Clayton's baseball games. And, and I know how desperately my college-age kids desire my equal attention. And so I felt bad that I hadn't been to see Zoe in a while and uh, thought, we better go there. And so we were in Manhattan, and we decided, we'll leave, though, and we'll head out after the meeting, and we'll go to the baseball. Zoe decided to come with us, and so we're driving to our next destination, and Zoe gets this uh, FaceTime call from one of her friends who had been babysitting for one of their professors during this event. And I, I, you know, I should feel bad for eavesdropping, I guess, but this FaceTime call in this car, you know, and you, what do you do, right? And so her friend's telling the story about babysitting for her professor, and they've got a couple of kids, and you know, they've got the instructions. If you're parents, you've done this, or you babysit, you've done this, right? The parents leave this set of instructions, here's what's for supper, and then you can watch this movie, and this is bedtime, and this is bedtime routine, get ready, and put them in bed, and have them all settled snugly into their beds by this uh, time. And so uh, that they're following these directions, and they decide it's a beautiful night. And so they let the kids go out and play a little while after their dinner, and they, they're not paying close attention, and they realize, oh, man, we've been playing outside until it's bedtime now. And so they rush the kids inside and try to get them ready. And the youngest is pretty easy. They're, they're done, right? They're ready. And so they get them in bed, read the story, and they're knocked out. The oldest, though, is taking forever to do things like brush his teeth. You know, it's a 17-minute process to brush his teeth. And, and then he said, sometimes I get to stay up in color. Now, we all know that he's a liar, <laughs> right? This little... This kid, he's never once been allowed to stay up and color a little later. But now the babysitter friend has this decision to make. Right? She's, she's telling us how, you know, I had to decide. And so I said, okay, well, maybe he's telling the truth. And he was, you know, he's an adorable little kid. And so you're going to let him color. And then he colors. And mom and dad show up. And the kid is out of bed, not put away, long after bedtime. And they're just, they're distraught. They're like, I don't know what he's going to say tomorrow. And I felt so bad. And so I'm listening to this conversation. And I say as loud as I can, I hope those kids are going to be all right. I mean, we know, you know, as a parent, hey, it's not supposed to go the way we said it's going to go. It doesn't go that way when we're there, so why would it go that way when you're there? And it's, it's going to be all right eventually. You know, we might pay for it tomorrow, but that's the parents bad and not the, you know, babysitter. But they, they felt so bad and they, they were concerned because they, they were dealing with these two fears. Truly, these two fears. They had this, this couple... This professor and his wife who they respected and they wanted to do a good job and they wanted, you know, to, to just, maybe they wanted the babysitting gig on another occasion. You know, they wanted to do a good job for this person that they admired and respected. But in the moment, they had this fear of being rejected by this little liar. <laughs> right? This cute little kid who says, sometimes I get to stay up in color. And they had to decide, do I say, no, you never get to stay up in color, or yeah, go get the coloring books and let's color together. I want to be accepted by you. And I don't, I don't know about you, but I've been there before in my life. You know, I know there's this direction that, that I ought to head, and I know that I want to, I want to say yes to the authority, to the right thing to do, to, to follow this narrow path, but in the moment... Man, that wide path looks so attractive. There are so many reasons, seemingly, that I ought to just walk down there and give in to this fear of, of acceptance or, or enjoyment or whatever it is. In the moment, this is what I want. This, this is what would be easier. It's interesting to me, this relationship and, and this, these kids these, that were being babysat there, this relationship between fear and rest, and how, you know, fear kind of kept them from the rest that they really needed. 
Now, I want to take a look at that fear, uh, that relationship between fear and rest this morning. And, and I want you to know that fear can have an appropriate role in our pursuit of rest. And I think that Hebrews chapter 4, the first 11 verses, teaches us three principles that help us to, to fear, to respect him, to honor him, and to find the rest that he offers. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them to Hebrews, the fourth chapter. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks here in Hebrews chapter 4. This morning, we're going to tackle the first 11 verses here as we consider three principles that help us to find the rest that God offers us. Hebrews chapter 4, this is what God's Word says. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter the rest as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from his works and again in this passage he said they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains for some to enter it and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience again he appoints a certain day today saying through David so long afterward and the words already quoted today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if Joshua had given them rest God would not have spoken of another day later on so then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. An interesting uh, 11 verses here. I think it teaches us three principles that can help us to, uh, to, for fear to have an appropriate role in us finding the rest that God offers. Uh, principle number one is that we ought to fear unbelief. That's, that's really what we ought to fear, is unbelief. Verse 1 says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands. Therefore, that's an important word. You ought, every time you read therefore in scripture, you ought to look back a little bit, and you kind of, if you take a little trip back to our study of, of Hebrews chapter 3, you might remember that the writer of Hebrews was, was examining uh, Psalm 95, and here we get the, the last part, part of Psalm 95 here. Psalm 95 is, is about uh, the, the nation of Israel and entering this rest or the promised land. In the, in the Old Testament, rest was really mostly about the land. It was about this, this opportunity to, to receive the promise that God had, had made to Abraham in the pursuit of that promised land. And in Psalm 95, we, we get this story of, of the Israelites just about to enter the promised land. Here in, in Hebrews chapter 4, if you, if you go back and you might remember the story of what happens. The nation has been led out of, out of Egypt by, by Moses, and, and now they're ready. They're thinking about the promised land. And, and you maybe remember a song, if you went to Sunday school, if you went to the same Sunday school I did when I was a kid, then you know this song about 12 spies who went to spy on Cain, and 10 were bad and 2 were good. And, and in Numbers, that's, that's the story we read here in, in uh, uh, Numbers chapter t uh, 12, uh, verse uh, 25, about these 12 spies. And, and it's retold in Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 19. And I want us to take a look at these verses, because we get these 12 spies, and 10 go in, or all 12 go in, and they come back, and 10 tell, offer this report that, yeah, the land is really cool. It's, they describe it as flowing with milk and honey. But man, the armies are big. The people are giants. Oh, we can't do this. And only two of those spies said, God's on our side. Let's go. And we get this retelling of the story here in Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting in verse 19. It says, Then we set out from Horeb and went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, You have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord the God of your fathers has told you. Do not fear or di be dismayed. There's no reason reason to worry. There's no reason to fear. God is with you. 
He's going to do the heavy lifting. Go and take this land. Then all of you came near me and said, let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again of the way by which we must go uh, up in the cities into which we shall come. Uh, The thing seemed good to me, and I took 12 men from you, one man from each tribe, and they turned and went up into the hill country and came to the valley of Eskol and, and spied it out. And they took in their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us and brought us word again and said, it's a good land that the Lord our God is giving us, yet you would not go up but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. They wouldn't go in. They heard the report and and they had contradictory reports, yes, but they wouldn't listen to God who said, I'm providing you this land. They rebelled against God. They dis obeyed him and so this rest that is offered and you turn over a few chapters in deuteronomy you get to deuteronomy chapter 12 verses 9 through 11 for you have not as yet come into the rest of the inheritance that the lord your god is giving you but when you go over uh, the jordan and live in the land that the lord your god is giving you to inherit and when he gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety then to the place that the lord your god will choose to make his name dwell there there you shall bring all that i command you your burn offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contributions that you present and all your finest vow offerings that you vow to the Lord. Did you notice that, that yes, in the Old Testament, mostly rest is about the land, but the rest is about the land because that's where God's name will dwell. When you get to the land, here will be the place to bring your sacrifices. Here will be the place to come and worship. Here you will dwell with me. And so this, in this rest that God offers is, is not just a, a, a place to stay, but a relationship to be. Uh, you, you, get to, you get to know him. That, man, that's good news. And that's what the writer of Hebrew is talking about in verse 2 of chapter 4. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. This good news is it's the word we, we call it the gospel. Right? This good news that Jesus proclaimed, that, that he's, he's uh, freeing the slave, that he's giving sight to the blind. We have this opportunity to say yes to him, and, and that's the good news that the writer offers. It's the rest that was offered to the recipients of this letter or sermon and to each one of us, and it was even offered to the nation of Israel as they saw the promised land. As they heard the reports from the 12 tribes, they had this opportunity to rest with God, to be in his presence, to be in relationship with him. And they chose to rebel. The writer of Hebrews talks about it like this. They did not benefit them, though, this good news, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. They were not united by faith with those who listened. They heard, but they didn't believe. And what did that unbelief look like? It looked like staying put. It looked like uh, disobedience. They didn't go into the land. And then God would say, I swore in my wrath that they shall not enter my rest. This good news that each one has available to us, I suppose if we had to summarize the good news... You know, what, what verse, I thought, would we, would we choose to summarize the good news? And, and I think many of us would jump to the most familiar verse, uh, you know, we hold it up at football games, right? It's the most famous verse of all time, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that's what, that's what faith looks like. To believe in Jesus. You turn a few chapters over in the Gospel of John and you get to John chapter 12, verse 26. And in John chapter 12, verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. If you want to know the Father, you need to know me. If you want to believe in me, You'll follow me. 
In John 3, 16, this famous verse, faith looks like belief, and we think, oh, this intellectual acknowledgement. Except when Jesus invited people to believe in him, what did he say? Follow me. Obey, walk like I walk. Come learn how to live like me. I wonder what the difference is in these two belief systems. And I think not so much. When we talk about believing Jesus, when we talk about fearing unbelief, we're talking about fearing this disobedience and the wrath that that draws. Yes, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, for we have... We who have believed enter the rest. We've obeyed. We're entering this rest even right now. As he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Psalm 95, the end of Psalm 95, talking about that generation of Israelites who would wander in the wilderness for 40 years and never enter the promised land. And I wonder if that wrath was more severe than even that. And we need to fear unbelief. I just talked to somebody this morning and they were, they were talking about how folks uh, get upset with the wrath of God and they were talking specifically about the flood of Noah. How could God do that? And people say, God is loving. How could he? And, and we, we're so arrogant that we believe that we can change who God is. We just miss the boat that there's one God and, and it's none of us. That God is who he is, that he's, he's this perfectly right, perfectly holy, perfectly loving God, and that it's, it's we who, who must submit to him. It's not so much that we ought to fear him, it's that we fear our own unbelief, our own disobedience. It's principle number one. Principle number two is that there's no need for the fear of missing out, that we're invited into this rest. Verse three promises us that when we believe, when we trust in him, when we follow after him, that we're already entering into this rest and someday we'll experience it to the full. Verse four says, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in the passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience again he appoints a certain day today saying through david so long afterward and the words already quoted today if you hear his voice do not harden your hearts for if joshua had given them rest god would not have spoken of another day later on so then there remains a sabbath rest for the people of god for whoever has entered god's rest has also rested from his works as god did from his we kind of get this whole history of rest. And it, and it starts all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. Uh, God creates the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rests. There's this Sabbath. It's a word that literally means to stop. God stopped his creation. And he invites us into that same kind of rest. If I asked this morning, you know, raise your hand if you're in need of a rest. Man, there'd be, there'd be hands. We're not going to take this because I, I'm leery of you guys. I'm resting right now. I'm not going to raise my hand. No. <laughs> Honestly, though, there'd be so many of us that say, yeah, I could use a rest. And it makes sense. I, I was reading just uh, some statistics about kind of the hurried pace of Americans. And it goes, it, this author took it back to 1879. That was the invention of the light bulb, Thomas Edison. He said before the invention of the light bulb, Americans slept on average for 11 hours a night. Today, that average is seven hours. And sometimes I wonder who they're talking to. Like, where are they, how do we get this average? Uh, there's no wonder that in just a, a century, we're kind of falling behind on maybe the rest that's needed. It talks about how uh, we're filling up our weeks with more work. In 1979, there was a report that came out that, that said by some year in the 2000s, people would be working three to four hours a week. That, you know, robots would be doing everything else. But instead, uh, since that time, Americans work on average four more hours a week than they did in 1979. Since the, the dawn of the digital age, let's say the year 2000, 
Americans' attention span, sometimes technology feeds into this hurriedness. Americans' uh, attention span has uh, dropped from 12 seconds, being able to pay attention to something for 12 seconds, to 8 seconds. And in a couple decades, I suppose that four-second drop is pretty significant. You might think, well, what's the big deal? The same research indicates that a, a goldfish's attention span is nine seconds. <laughs> We're officially dumber than a goldfish. We're just so hurried. We have to fill up this time. If we have, a, we have a moment with nothing to do, how many of us, our first reaction is to reach for our phone? Let me see what's going on. I'm going to scroll through some of this. Some uh, experts describe this. Some doctors are describing this condition as hurry sickness. When 39% of Americans say they're more anxious this year than they were last year. Oh, we, we are pursuing all sorts of things and we're filling up our days with all sorts of stuff and we're hurrying to the point where we're literally making ourselves sick. Mentally, physically, and spiritually sick. We were designed for this Sabbath principle to be exercised in our lives. It's interesting that experts in the workplace say that there are a couple places when the number of hours worked, when productivity just drops off. And they, they say one is at like 70 hours. If you work more than 70 hours in a week, you literally should just stop because you're not being any more productive than you were up until about, you know, 55 is kind of the, the next drop off. There's a drop off at 55 hours, and then it just drops off a cliff at 70. If you're over 70 hours, then you might as well be asleep because you're not producing anything. And this, this 55 hour mark, it's so interesting to me because I'm a preacher, right? I'm not a mathematician. But I think if you take six days and you figure somewhere between eight and 10 hours of work a day, you get right around that 55 hour mark, don't you? It's almost like somebody designed it that way. It's almost like somebody put it together. And if we listened, if we really feared the appropriate voice, then we could live in this rest that he offers us. Now we're going to mess it up. And that's why I think the rest of, of Hebrews here in, in chapter 4, these next few verses are so important. Because God sort of goes through this history. He's like, here is the Sabbath, and, and the Sabbath day, by the way, keep it holy. And then people didn't, right? We messed it up. And so he's going to offer us some more time of more opportunities to seek this rest. And again in the passage he said, they shall not enter my rest, in verse 5, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear uh, his voice, do not harden your hearts. Did you notice we go back to Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 2, we're going to get to the Exodus, uh, Psalm 95, hey, enter and rest, they disobeyed, you're not entering my rest. We're going to go to King David again. You're offered this opportunity to rest. We're going to mess it up again. And we get to verse 8. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Wait, Joshua again. And, and, and this is really interesting because you think, oh, we kind of went backwards from David to Joshua. Except that this, this Greek word that is translated as Joshua is also the Greek word that we translate as Jesus. So scholars debate about this. Who are we talking about? Are we talking about Old Testament Joshua? Are we talking about Jesus? Are we talking about Old Testament Joshua, but with a nod towards New Testament Jesus? And I think probably that's what's going on here, right? We're, we're definitely talking about Old Testament Joshua, Psalm 95, leading the people into the promised land. But that's just a type of the rest that God really offers. If we want real, godly rest, then it doesn't, it doesn't stop in a promised land or a promised home. It stops in the promise of Jesus in relationship with him. And we're offered this, this godly rest even today. 
there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. What does that sound like? Verse 10, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. It sounds like this, this place where we are going to really, really experience God's rest. It was, it was talked about by the, the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. They, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit, and the Spirit of the Lord shall be uh, rest upon him, and the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide decide disputes by what his ears hear, but his righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together and a little child shall lead them. This godly rest in the very presence of Jesus when we say yes to him. Oh, we, we are trying to fill up our lives with so much stuff for fear of missing out. And God says, no, there's this real prize. There's this actual rest that I have to offer you. And it's just in saying yes to him. No wonder we get to principle number three here in Hebrews chapter four, verse 11, where the fear should motivate us to act. Verse 11 says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. It's so interesting here that the author of Hebrews would be talking about rest, and, and here he says, okay, but, but I want you to strive. The, this Greek word here that we translate as strive, it has, has both a time element and an effort element. It means to work hard, to effort towards something, but also to do that now, don't delay it, our, our rest in Jesus begins when we say yes to him, when we enter into a relationship with him. It's when the, Saul, who is renamed by Jesus Paul, meets him on that road, and, and then he goes into town and he's blind, and he, he finds this, this prophet, this, this servant of God that, that uh, Jesus instructed him to look for, and, and then they have this conversation, and in Acts chapter uh, 22, we get to the end of that conversation in verse 16, and, and that servant says to Paul, and now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name name if you're if you're looking for this rest that god is promising us don't wait say yes to him if you need to begin a relationship with jesus for the first time and be baptized into his name i just want you to write the word rest on that welcome home card drop it in that wooden box i'm going to talk to you this week about how to take those steps how to find that real rest that jesus offers us Take that step, that, that striving. We, we don't, for some reason, we have a real hard time with this idea that, that to, to, to walk with Jesus means taking those steps and really walking with Jesus. It means living a life like him. In Matthew chapter 11, there's this, uh, Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's this great invitation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus offers us this invitation to rest, and it's to walk with him. One scholar described, said that every rabbi had a yoke. And it's not a yoke they had for their oxen. It was this yoke, in other words, this way of life. That every rabbi said, these are, the, these are the things you ought to do to live a godly life. And here Jesus is describing his yoke. And when he describes it as light and easy, he doesn't mean that it's no sweat, that taking those steps aren't difficult. 
He means that when you take this step to follow after him, you can enjoy this rest. You can be in relationship with me. And someday, you'll, you'll be in that, that place of, of rest forever and ever and ever in my presence. You know, it's no different than, I, I was in small group this last week, and somebody said, hey, Lance, do you like to grill? And I said, have you been, you know, are you looking at me? Of course I like to grill. He said, oh, well, I've got this grill at home, and I think it's really cool, and he was talking about it a little bit. And I said, well, is that a grill or like a smoker? Do you grill stuff or do you smoke you know, are you smoking meats for hours on end? He said, I do some of both. And what, what, what about you? I said, oh, I, I love the idea of smoking meats, right? Now, take a look at me. Of course, I love the idea of that. But it, like, takes 16 hours. I mean, I have no, t I, I don't want to invest that time. I just refuse to make the investment to get the end result that I think would be really cool. You know, some of you, I haven't had this conversation. Some of you have, have had a conversation where you said, I think I would love to run a marathon someday. You know, I would love this end result. But so few of us have the desire, the will, that we, we aren't willing to invest the training that's required to get the end result. You know, back to a more realistic conversation for me, I'm, I'm drinking a cup of coffee in, in our staff meeting, and, and somebody mentioned, hey, you're drinking coffee, and I said, yeah, I, I haven't had a Diet Coke since the new year, but I'm going back any day now. <laughs> and so I, you know, but I, I still, I drink a cup of coffee because I need I'm still an addict, right? I need the drug delivery system somehow, and so a little caffeine. And so I, I have a cup of coffee, and, and I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it. I don't know what I'm going to do in the summer when it's hot out. This doesn't make sense to me. It's 95 degrees, and I'm drinking this steaming, boiling cup of coffee. And I don't know, that doesn't sound that great to me. And they said, well, you should try cold brew. And I said, well, okay, explain this to me. Because as I understand it, you, you kind of brew it in just whatever, a jug or what have you, and you just set it out. And for hours, and then you put it in the fridge, and it gets cold, and then like a day or 19 later, you have cold brew. And they're like, well, kind of. Right? And again, I'm back to the same place. It sort of sounds like I would enjoy the end result, but I just don't want to commit to the, the hours of preparation to get it done. I'm not willing to take those steps. You know, the Apostle John in, in his letter that we call 1 John said that if you want to know Jesus, you need to walk like Jesus walked. Uh, so many of us say, man, Jesus, his, what he says and what he teaches makes so much sense. And if we would follow that, the world would be a better place. We want the end result. We're just not willing to take those steps to actually walk like he walked. You know, fear should motivate us to act, to say yes to him. And when we say yes to him, that relationship with him ought to motivate us to make a change in our life, to really follow him, to pick up this yoke and experience how light and easy the way of Jesus is, how much rest it offers us. Don't wait. We've been back and forth a little bit to Bartlesville. I've got a couple of college-age kids there, and they're going to stay in an apartment together next year. And so Sherry's new favorite thing is to buy things for this apartment, you know, and she's nesting there already and doing that stuff. And we've been taking some stuff there. And, and uh, one day Sherry was there, and she called me. I wasn't in town with her, and she said, I think there's an animal in the apartment. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I, I'm by the dryer, and it sounds like there's an animal in the apartment. I said, well, kill it, or call the landlord. You know, I'm 400 miles away, and so I, I can't do anything. And, and she said, I'm going to go, and she looked around, and she discovered, she thinks, that there's birds living in the dryer vent uh, out of this apartment. 
And sure enough, there are birds there. We were just there last week, and Lacey he said, Dad, come listen to these birds. And, and she's like, I'm just, I can't live here because these birds are going to get into the house. And I'm trying to explain to her that this is a kind of a one-way deal, in and out, that they're not going to be able, even if it's annoying, they can't get into the house. Now, that doesn't solve the problem that having living creatures and nesting in your dryer vent may cause. And so I'm there and I Google, I like, they're like, what do we do? And I'm like, call the landlord. That's really their, keep pestering them until they do something. But I'm going to Google this. Birds in your dryer vent, what to do? And an article pops up right away. There's birds in your dryer vent, nesting in your dryer vent. This is what you do. And so I read the article and the article says, just leave them alone. <laughs> they're nesting because they've laid eggs. And when the baby birds are hatched, they'll leave. And I think this is the dumbest article I've ever read. I, I, this advice is literally just do nothing. I've got this 22-year-old son that I'm trying to mentor here, and dumb Google says, just tell him to blow it off. Right? This, I, first of all, the nest in the dryer vent could be a problem down the road, even if the birds leave. We're not going to trust them to clean up their nest. We, gotta, we probably got to handle this, but I just thought, don't do anything. Wait. Don't move. What terrible advice. If you're dealing with some kind of hurt that's heavy, that's hard to carry, if you really need rest, man, let that fear motivate you to action and say yes to him. Begin a relationship with him when you can experience a yoke that is light and easy, a way of life that begins right now and stretches into eternity that offers the rest that only God can rest. Don't wait. Do it today. Let's stand and worship him.